Okay, hi everyone. Today I'm gonna to give you a primer on Descartes' meditations and uh, specifically we're going to talk about Descartes' dualism. The goal will be to understand why Descartes adopts what we call Cartesian dualism, which is a kind of substance dualism, a view on which there are two types of things in the universe that are different types of things. They're not transferable one into the other, and the two types of things are mental things on the one hand, things like conscious existences, I suppose, spirits, maybe souls, and on the other hand you have material bodies which are extended in space. Ghost in the Shell is the next generation of animated feature entertainment. A lot of philosophy classes start uh, by talking about Descartes. Uh, you end up studying Descartes in early modern philosophy courses, in epistemology courses, and in philosophy of mind courses like this one. You might wonder why Descartes is so notable. Actually, when he was alive, Descartes wasn't terribly famous, historians tell us. René Descartes was born in 1596 in France, in a town that was later named after him uh, after he died. His mother died when he was a baby, so he lived with his grandmother growing up, and he was prone to illness, um, so he was sick a lot. Descartes studied law, actually, but he was fascinated by math and logic, and he learned theology and medicine as well, you know, the 16th century version of each of those things. Besides philosophy, he made significant contributions and advancements in theoretical physics. He introduced what we now call Cartesian geometry, uh, which incorporates algebra, and through his laws of refraction, which is uh, something he studied in optics, uh, he developed an empirical understanding of rainbows. And he also proposed a naturalistic account of the formation of the solar system, although he felt he had to suppress much of that because of Galileo's fate at the hands of the Inquisition. And for those of you who are very curious about historical events, Descartes himself also faced a little bit of trouble with the Inquisition. He was a Catholic. Uh, after his death, his books were put on a list of basically banned books, and so they were they were surreptitiously circulated for a while, and uh, Descartes' name is well known today, even though during his lifetime and after his death, there was, there was a lot of controversy surrounding some of his ideas. Now, Descartes' Meditations. It's a text that has six parts. Descartes calls each of these parts meditations, so there are six meditations in Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. Um, we're mostly going to be focusing in today's class on the second meditation, which is where Descartes uh, puzzles over the difference between mind or soul and body, uh, between extended things and unextended thinking things. Descartes called his piece, The Meditations, for really kind of basic reasons. He's sitting in a cabin by himself, he's deliberately isolated himself from other people, and he's trying to uh, introspect about the nature of himself as a thinking being. The philosopher Christian Mercer at Columbia University has argued that Descartes' uh, meditations aren't terrifically original, they're not unprecedented in the history of philosophy, and I happen to think she's right. There are other philosophers um, and theologians, like for example Saint Teresa of Avila, who uh, conducted meditations as a part of a spiritual journey or a philosophical journey, um, into thinking about uh, knowledge, which is what Descartes sets out to do. So Descartes' meditations are a project to try to figure out what Descartes can know with certainty, what we can know with certainty. So he proposes that he's going to basically pretend like he doesn't believe anything at all, and beginning with only his own body and his own senses. He wants to figure out what it is possible to come to know with certainty. Essentially, he's adopted what at that time was called a geometric method, which we now call the deductive method, for coming to uh, true propositions. All right, so essentially, if we're acting like Descartes, we are now telling ourselves, all right, forget everything that you think you've learned from childhood up until this moment, doubt everything possible. You don't know even the most basic things. You don't know whether you have an extended body. You don't know 
whether, you know, things are specific colors. You don't know how many people exist on the planet. You don't know how old you are. None of those things we are starting out with any certainty about. And that what we want to do is see how much we can deductively arrive at and how much we can justify out of the things that maybe we, we believed, but now want to believe with certainty. That now we want to believe having a grasp on their absolute truthfulness. All your memories about your wife and your daughter are false and are more like a dream. We call this approach methodological skepticism. It's a methodological form of skepticism because it's about the process by which we determine what we will and will not believe, as opposed to other kinds of skepticism which are sometimes less about a process and more about a particular content of skepticism. There, you can be a skeptic about particular things. Methodological skepticism isn't about being skeptical about one or another thing in particular, but it's about the approach toward what it is that we accept as true. The way that Descartes puts his project is this. Uh, for any thing that I think or that I think I know, I'm going to think of it as possibly being false. I, I'm going to think, could it be false? I'm going to ask myself that question. And it will turn out um, as part of the upshot of this meditation that it, it may be the case that we can't rely on our perceptions with any kind of certainty. How do we get there? Well, Descartes ponders uh, everyday objects that he has around him. All right, so think of a wax candle, a regular one, like one you might have at home for dinner parties, like this one. Wait. It's got a set shape. It's got a set color. It's a white candle. Not much to remark, really. It seems like it has specific features. It seems like I can say of this candle, these are the properties that it has. But candles change over time, right? In some ways they change a little bit faster than some other objects, like, you know, my body changes over time, but the candle can, can do quite wild things. Like if I light it, the candle uh, changes shape. The wax of the candle now suddenly has other properties. Now it's a liquid, it's not a solid at all. And, and notice how the wax isn't clear unlike the candle. Bill Nye the Science Guy! Bill Nye the Science Guy! And now there's, there's, there's fire, there's a flame, and the flame alters the properties of the candle. It alters the properties of the wax. The wick on a lit candle is no longer white. All of these properties are subject to change. Science rules! So what is the wax in the first place? I thought I had a grasp on the kind of substance that it was. This is how Descartes thinks, right? I, I thought that it was like a solid substance wax, but, but it might not be, right? It can, it, it's got very different properties now than it had just about a minute ago. So what is my perception telling me about the candle at all? Is my perception able to grasp objects as they really are? We're not sure. Right? We're not sure that perception tells us the, the essential nature of things. And so what results is what we might call Cartesian skepticism. Cartesian skepticism has the outlook that we maybe can't rely on our perceptions for absolute certainty about things in the world. Another way we can arrive at methodological skepticism is by thinking about how easily we can be fooled when we're dreaming into thinking that we're awake. Sometimes I've had very, very convincing, vivid dreams where I think that I'm in one place doing one kind of thing, and I wake up a while later only to realize that all of it was inside my own head. It seems like I'm able to trick myself. And we can imagine that if I can trick myself in this way, if I can be deceived by apparent perceptions, then it might also be possible for other beings to trick me. So Descartes begins wondering, well, what about the possibility that there could be an evil demon, he says, that is controlling everything that I see. And so I think that there's a world around me. I think that there are things like candles and walls. Um, 
I think that candles are physical objects, but really the evil demon is just generating these images in my mind and I'm asleep and I, I will never find out. He could be deceiving me about everything. So I really can't trust my perceptions. I need to be able to think through what it is that I can know with certainty. So here's one core thing that I would like to know. I would like to know whether I exist. Seems kind of important, right? <laughs> I'm starting to doubt whether there are walls around me, whether there are candles and, and other objects, whether I have hands or not. Maybe all of that is, is just a projection. But do I exist? Descartes notes that he has an issue because we can't assume that there are things with bodies or with extension, right? Because we know about extended things that is, anything with a determinable shape and a definable location um, and which can occupy space in such a way as to exclude any other body, right? So candle takes up space, can't, can't have two candles in the same spot, that'd be cheating, bad physics. But we, we seem to have bodily attributes, right? Uh, I, I have arms and stuff, it seems to me. But Descartes just noted that our perception isn't fully reliable. We haven't yet established that we can trust our perception with certainty. There are all kinds of cases in which we might be fooled through our senses, some of them more nefarious than others. But basically, perception doesn't get us certain reliable knowledge. And so uh, we, we only access stuff, as far as we know so far, uh, about our extended selves through our perception. I, you know, I can see my arm, I can touch my own arm, but all of those are sense perceptions. I can hear, you know, um, maybe the movements of my hands through space. Um, but again, all of that is sense perception. So maybe I don't know that I exist. But hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, let's not panic. Descartes thinks he's found an exception to the uncertainty. The fact that I think, right? So almost all of me seems to be extended in space, but what about my capacity to think? Thought is something that I can't separate from myself. That is to say, I can't be tricked about thinking, about whether I am thinking, that is. I mean, think about it. If there were an evil demon that was controlling the things that I saw and the things that uh, I felt, and, and making it so that the reality around me wasn't really there, that demon wouldn't be able to convince me that I wasn't thinking. I mean, maybe he could trick me into believing falsely I am not thinking, but every time that I'm wondering whether or not I am thinking, I, I, I am thinking, <laughs> right? Um, if I think I have been deceived, I am thinking. So no matter what I do in order to ponder these questions, it, it is an essential condition of pondering them, that there is something that is thinking. So Descartes says the following. So after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. He says a little bit later in the same page, I am, I exist, that is certain, for as long as I am thinking. So you might have heard the phrase uh, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Descartes does actually write that, just not in this particular work. He writes it in um, his Methods, Discourse on Method, which is a different text. Um, but more or less, it, it comes to the same point. So this is how... Descartes puts knowledge of himself as a thinking thing. He says, it doesn't depend on any things of whose existence I am unaware. All right, so whether or not I think doesn't depend on anything else on his view. I have, in a sense, direct access to my own ability to think. I don't have to acknowledge that I have a body in order to acknowledge that I am thinking. Furthermore, Descartes says, he doesn't just exist. He seems to find it evident 
that he could also doubt, understand, affirm, deny, will, not will, imagine, and have sensory perceptions. He thinks all of these activities are part of his thoughts. So in a way, Descartes is building a lot into the idea of thought because all of these different mental activities, you know, imagining, denying, affirming, um, all of those he includes in the realm of things that are thought-like. So things that don't depend on my knowing some other thing besides that I am thinking in order for me to access it directly and be quite certain about it. Can you think of any objections to this line of reasoning? There's a home exercise for you. One problem we come across is that, and Descartes acknowledges this, he seems to see objects in the world more clearly than his own self. How clearly can you grasp your own internal mental states? How clearly are you sure what it is to have a thought? Can you describe what it's like to be having a thought? Is it like inner speech? Not quite, right? But, but almost maybe? But the more you think about it, the further away it gets. Like, what, what is an internal thought like? Some of us might have mental imagery. We might have uh, colorful internal images pop up in our minds when we are thinking about visual objects. Um, but other people don't. And you might think that even if you do have them, it's hard to describe exactly how they are visual because they might not identically resemble the objects that you really do see with your physical eyes. And so it seems like the more we introspect, the fuzzier it gets. But my perception of objects like this candle is pretty straightforward. I, I, I have a lot of descriptive data available to me. I can say a lot of things about what I seem to be seeing, at least. And I'm pretty sure about what it is, what, what information is contained in what I seem to be seeing. If I had just the right vocabulary, I'd be able to report exactly what it is that this candle looks like to me. But moving on, our main concern for this class today is to figure out why it is that Descartes concludes, eventually, that minds and bodies are separate substances. How do we get there? Well, the answer is in the sixth meditation, all the way at the end, once Descartes has completed his whole loop of uh, introspection and meditation on knowledge. Uh, by this point, Descartes takes himself to have shown that the external world really does exist. So he goes through kind of a circuitous route. He, he ends up first proving that he can know that God exists, and then from there is able to generate a lot of other things that he knows. Uh, we won't go through all of that stuff in the middle, but I will provide some resources uh, for you guys to explore that topic should you be curious about it. Descartes describes himself as a res cogitans. What does that mean? Here's, here's Descartes. I am then, in the strict sense, only a thing that thinks. That is, I am a mind, or an intelligence, or intellect, or reason. Words whose meaning I have been ignorant of until now. But he says, I also have a body, a res extensa. So my res cogitans is my thinking self. That's the thing that I know for certain that I have. I'm a res cogitans, I'm a being that thinks. But I also have a, a, a res extensa, a body, a thing that exists in space, right? That is extended in space and has spatial properties. How can we exclude the possibility that res cogitans is the same as res extensa. So if, we, if we're now sure that all of the things exist that we originally thought, can we then come to the conclusion that, for example, my thinking is just the same thing as my, my activity through my bodily properties? Like, for example, maybe my thought um, happens because of my brain. My brain is the thing that thinks. Those two things might be identical. Why, why can't we say that, according to Descartes? Descartes does say, the thing that I am fully, when I describe myself as an I, is the union of a mind and a body. But he doesn't think that the mind is identical to the body, for the following reason. He has an argument, and I will walk you through his argument. Premise one, I know that everything which I can clearly and distinctly understand is capable of being created by God so as to correspond exactly to my understanding of it. This needs to be digested a little bit. So what Descartes is saying is, if there's something that I can think of, anything at all that I can think of, 
because God is all-powerful, God could potentially create that thing just in the way that I'm thinking of it, right? If he couldn't, then he wouldn't be all-powerful. So that's got to be something God can do. So anything that I can conceive seems to be possible. Maybe it doesn't really exist, but, it, but it's possible because it's possible for God to create it. So suppose that, that God could create anything that I could clearly and distinctly understand. That's premise one. Premise two says, hence the fact that I can clearly and distinctly understand one thing apart from another is enough to make me certain that the two things are distinct since they are capable of being separated, at least by God. So what Descartes is saying is that if I can imagine two things being different from each other, even if maybe coincidentally they are unified right now, if I can imagine them being different from each other, then they can't be identical. That is to say, they can't be the same entity. Here's an example that might help you chew through this a little bit. So you seem to be able to imagine Superman without Clark Kent, right? If you can imagine Superman without Clark Kent, Descartes is saying, there's a possibility out there in the universe that Superman and Clark Kent are not the same person. Somewhere in an imaginary universe, Superman and Clark Kent are different people. That is possible, Descartes thinks, because I can imagine it, and if I can imagine it, then God can make it be so. Now we're going to apply this type of thinking to the mind and body, okay? So, first of all, this is premise three, I have a clear and distinct idea of my body as an extended, non-thinking thing. I, I understand my body, I understand that it is a non-thinking, extended object. Premise four, I have a clear and distinct idea of myself as a thinking, non-extended thing. Right? We've established that in meditation too. I can conceive of myself, and the only way I can conceive of myself minimally is as a thinking being, a res cogitans. So the last part of our argument takes us to applying all of these things, putting all these ideas together. Because it seems like the essential properties that I am aware of of my thinking self are different from the essential properties of my extended self, I can conceive of them coming apart. I can conceive of myself having my mind without having my body. And similarly, I can conceive of my body existing without my mind. Because I can conceive of them being separate, God could make it be the case that they are separate. Therefore, they're not one end the same. They might be unified, that is, they might be joined together in a way that makes it hard to distinguish them, say, perceptually. But if God could make them come apart, then they're not identical. Hold on, you might be thinking, how are minds and bodies unified if they're, if they're different things? But Descartes has a theory that we call interactionism. It's an interactionist substance dualism. So Descartes thinks that there are thinking things in the world and there are extended things in the world. There are two different kinds of substances, but they can interact. Minds can cause bodies to act and bodies can cause minds to have thoughts under certain circumstances. He thinks that it happens by means of a certain gland in the brain. And we'll get to an objection to Descartes from a contemporary of his, Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who exchanged some letters with Descartes and challenged him on this part of his theory. Minimally, we can concede that Descartes' brain is important to Descartes having some kinds of mental states. So it doesn't matter so much whether he's right that the mind and the body interact through this gland in the brain. It matters more that he thinks that there's some point at which they interact. Um, but notice that the fact that Descartes thinks that brains and minds can interact doesn't mean that he thinks they're identical. So the brain is necessary for the mind, maybe, to do some of the things that it can do. Like, for example, we know that information about the world comes to me partly through physical means. My eye is a physical object, and my seeing this candle um, requires my eye to activate in certain ways. And so Descartes just thinks that that physical process influences my mental self, but it's 
it's not the case that because my mind is influenced that it necessarily has to be extended on his view. So his brain is necessary for him to interact with the world, but it's not necessary for him to have thoughts at all. Because again, he can have thoughts without having thoughts about the world outside of himself on his view. Putting the interactionist point a different way, Descartes thinks his body is not necessary to him being himself. Descartes concedes that nature teaches him he has a body. He feels pain, he feels hunger, and so on and so forth. And not just in the way that a sailor has a ship, for example. He's closer linked to his body than a sailor is to his ship. But still, Descartes thinks that his body is separable from himself. So here's a question we can ask. How do you show that a particular object is not identical to another object? How do you show that x is not equal to y? Well, we need a property that x has and y does not have, and vice versa. We call this property the differentiating property. Leibniz's law, uh, developed by the slightly later philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, Leibniz's law says if x equals y, then they have all of their properties in common. So if we can find a property that x and y don't share, then we can show that they're not identical. For Descartes, the property that mind and body don't share is the, uh, the property of extension, right? So body is extended in space, but thinking doesn't seem to necessarily require being extended in space. So for Descartes, they're separable. We can imagine them being separate, and so they're non-identical. There's a couple of different ways to reconstruct Descartes' argument for dualism. We can distinguish epistemic ways of distinguishing mind and body, according to Descartes, and metaphysical ways of distinguishing mind and body. Epistemic ways uh, that have to do with how we come to know our minds, metaphysical ways have to do with how things are or how things exist, or what kinds of things things are. So I'll give you a few arguments that correspond to each type, ways of parsing um, this defense of substance dualism, but this is kind of a bonus and an extra. Here is an argument from doubt, which is one way of putting uh, the argument for substance dualism. Premise one, I am such that my existence cannot be doubted. Premise two, my body is not such that its existence cannot be doubted. Therefore, I am not identical with my body. Therefore, the thinking thing that I am, that is my mind, is not identical with my body. We can ask of this argument, in order to figure out whether or not it works, which of these premises is most dubious or leaves us with questions? Which one do you think it is? Now here is a metaphysical version of the argument. We call this the argument from essential nature. Premise one, my essential nature is to be a thinking thing. That's what Descartes thinks, right? He thinks I am a res cogitans. He thinks he is a res cogitans. Premise two, my body's essential nature is to be an extended thing in space. Premise three, my essential nature does not include being an extended thing in space. Therefore, I'm not identical with my body. And since I am a thinking thing, namely a mind, a res cogitans, my mind is not identical with my body. Here's another metaphysical version of the argument for substance dualism. This is an argument from possibility. So premise one, if anything is material, it is essentially material. Premise two, however, I am possibly immaterial. That is, it's, there's a possible way for things to be in which I exist without a body. Premise three, hence I am not essentially material. And final conclusion, hence it follows with the first premise that I am not material. The key takeaway that we're left with is that if we follow Descartes' reasoning, we have to think that minds and bodies are non-identical uh, types of things because we can conceive of them being separated. We can conceive of at least one property that they don't share that allows us to distinguish them in our minds. And if we can distinguish them, then it follows, or so it seems to follow, that they're separable. One thing we can ask is, is it really the case that in all of the situations in which we can think that two things are not the same, that it follows that they really are not the same? 
So consider the following real-life case. The last star you can see in the morning, as it's dawning, the last visible star, we call the morning star. And the first star that you can see at night, when the sun is setting, or beginning to set, we call the evening star. Uh, these stars have various names across cultures. Uh, another name for them is Hesperus and Phosphorus. For a time, people believed that these two stars were different stars. It seemed very possible and sometimes even likely because they seem to appear at different part, parts of the night sky, right? So uh, the, the sun appears in one place and, and sets in another place, and that star is located in a different place. The morning star seems to be a different entity than the evening star. But it turns out both the morning star and the evening star are the planet Venus. So they're identical. But it does seem, doesn't it, that we can conceive that the morning star could have been different from the evening star, right? So does it follow that the morning star is not identical to the evening star? If it does, then it feels like Descartes has a defense for his argument. But if it doesn't, then it feels like his reasoning might not apply in every case. And so his reasoning might not apply in the case of the mind-body problem. It might not be the case that just because we can conceive of minds being separate from bodies, that therefore they are. What do you think? Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Next time we'll talk about Princess Elizabeth's uh, objection to Descartes, which doesn't have to do with the identity problem, but instead has to do with her objections to interactionism, to whether it is possible for something that's not extended to interact with something that is extended.